The top 20 video game music tracks from 2014 chosen by you, Claudio, Rudy, Steve, Zenmus, El Azul, and Chris. This is my pick from Final Fantasy XIII's End of Trilogy, Lightning Returns. This is Luxurian Day, the extended version. The background, of course, from South Park's Sick of Truth when you visit the Kingdom of Canada. God, I love this track. It used to be my alarm clock. And as we get closer to the real end of the world, this track gets more and more poignant. But on to our first real selection. First pick chosen by Claudio from the incredible Shovel Knight. This is Courage Under Fire, composed by Jake Kaufman. <laughs> gracious how bloody good is that eh it is a little funny that well, the first track that we play for music from 2014 is obviously incredibly retro infused but I mean it's not really representing 2014 in a sense of what music was at that time what it is representing is that 2014 was another resurgence in indie games there were a lot of great ones Transistor was a great one we'll hear some music from later on binding of isaac afterbirth we'll hear from later on and while the ps4 and the xbox one were trying to get their feet wet this is the first xbox one not the first xbox but the first xbox one before the xbox one x and the series s and series x of course project scorpio shovel knight i i i agree with chris that not super memorable but really really good I wonder why it's not super memorable. Maybe because these kind of tracks, we're used to hearing them in the games of our youth that we would play over and over and over again, and there just wasn't that much time to really sink in with it. I mean, Shovel Knight's a challenging game, but you tend to, um, you tend to rip through it. Not, it's it's not as challenging as like a Dark Souls, even though it has some Dark Souls tendencies of some tough boss battles, and uh, when you die, you need to come back and grab all your. Uh, loot, and if you don't get it on the first attempt. But I, I found the difficulty in Shovel Knight, like, just perfect. I What I love about the Shovel Knight music is that it's it's really immaculate, and it's incredibly emotional. It does a lot of that sort of dramatic, romantic era uh, counterpoint movement that I just love. And it's very, very accurate to that time. It's sort of like, what would the NES sound like if you really had almost unlimited resources with it and, and you could flesh it out a little bit more? But a great track. 
Our next track chosen by Rudy from Transistor. This is Waterwall, composed by Darren Korb. expecting that accordion but it was really nicely placed and they, it sounds like they put a bit of a modulation on it to give it just a slightly cyberpunky feel make it sound like an electric accordion with a bit of the you got some of this like dirty gain on the piano what a really nice it's it's like a beautiful kind of halftime trip hoppy feel that like pumping side chain compression the drums are so confident, but the rest of it is barely there, ethereal. But there's also got this overall, like, really happy sort of feel to it, like you're in a rain-soaked, depressing, cyberpunk, futuristic city where people are beaten down by the corporate overlords and uh, you're know, one mistake away from death. And then you happen to stumble into a dirty alley, but there's the glow of a light, of a neon light, and you find a little hole-in-the-wall bar run by an accordion-playing dwarf fixer. We'll put a uh, cybernetic accordions in everybody. Ooh. Next up, chosen by Steve. This is from Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. Zinnia Battle Music, composed by Shota Kageyama. <laughs>
ducks in a row we've had this uh, really hyperactive drums that really drive the whole thing. More almost like a garage drum and bass sort of UK feel with a traditional sort of like heavy hitting RPG feel behind it. And then those violins that, like I said in the chat, do sound very Square Enix like Claudio was saying. Whether that's a viola or a violin sound, uh, the main melody really sounds like something Masashi Hamazu would use. Who we're going to hear from a couple times for his work in Lightning Returns. And he also, this would also fit really well in what he did for Final Fantasy XIII 2, a game that came before Lightning Returns. We've got another track from Lightning Returns, chosen by Zenmus. This is Yusnan Day, composed by Masashi Hamazu. <laughs> That's another one we've heard in this vein of really exciting frenetic drums, some synth and modern elements mixed with really traditional instruments like accordions or violins, different stringed instruments that sound like they're localized to a certain region. Like, especially this one too, it's almost like there's bagpipes underneath there. This big kind of drone, like you, get in, you, you could be in some sort of like futuristic market in Marrakesh or something, which I think really encapsulates this world. This is from the Final Fantasy Wiki. Yusnan is a city alive with lights and fireworks, and the people wander the streets as if in a dream. This is the third region of the game. Only a short time remains before the world ends, but the city is alive with banquets and festivities. The people feel free to indulge their every desire. So an interesting thing about Lightning Returns is that people I believe they know that the world is ending. They either know that the world is ending, or they know that they're like stuck in a time loop where they never age so people choo uh, choose to deal with that in different ways which is funny that dying very soon or never dying can be construed as the same can have the same negative uh, impact super fun from El Azul, he's chosen God of War from Samurai Warrior 4 El Azul did not list the composer because El Azul says fuck you composers
a nice track. You know, it, it does have almost a sort of generic type um, electro beat underneath it. Where it sounds definitely like it's taken another track and remixed it. Um, but I do like in the B section how it goes from to more like which is a bit more of that kind of drum and bass feel we've been hearing this whole time. A lot of traditional instruments. But yeah, like I said, this one doesn't sound so much like it was built together with that. It does sound like they took the traditional instruments and like there was an original track and then they just kind of added this beat over top of it. But I think it would work really well for a Warriors game where you need to have lots of energy and lots of action. Chris has brought us Planetary Annihilations Towards the Stars, composed by Howard Mostrom. find sci-fi games especially the, well these sci-fi building games and strategy they're so funny because the music is so epic and the ideas and your imagination is so epic when you're playing these games but really it's a lot of it's a lot of this like click, 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 spreadsheet stuff it never looks as as epic we get this all the time when we listen to music from Stellaris <laughs> and how huge that sounds and then you watch gameplay from Stellaris and you're going who, who, who's doing what? This uses the very classic um, boom, 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 ba, boom, 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 ba, that yeah, da, 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 da. that note there in the chord yeah, is an extension of the major chord that just lifts the uh, the major third a little bit higher, and it gives it this sort of like, whoa, or is it the sixth? Yeah, you're adding the sixth onto it. And, which can be used to make things sound like show tunes, and it can also usually is used to make things sound like very, it's like epic, like a, like a note has risen above the main chord. That's pretty funny. Well, that ends our first round of picks. Starting off our second round, El Azul has another track from Lightning Returns. This is Crimson Blitz, also composed by Masashi Mazu. <laughs>
a big callback to Masashi Hamazu's battle theme in Final Fantasy XIII. This adds a bit more, a bit more weight to it, a bit more uh, heavier guitar. Um, I mean, it was it was nice to have a bit of a callback because it's still the same character of Lightning battling, and I don't, I'm not sure when this happens in the game if it is used in, a, in an effective way. I think it kind of it plays with time a bit more, and the rhythms, and just kind of stretches some things out and contracts them. And since in this game you're sort of going through time and freezing time a lot, I guess that makes sense. I think Masashi Yamazu was a perfect choice for the very challenging proposition of composing for this trilogy, and somebody to take the baton from our Lord and Savior, Nobuo Uematsu. Claudio has chosen from Guilty Gear Exerd, Lily of Steel, composed by Daisuke Ichiwatari. <laughs> hear uh, these like pounding rock songs with a shitload of really distorted guitar, I tend to think the worst and I find them to be really boring and really generic. This one goes to some incredible places and has some great playing with a lot of emotion in it. You can you can still feel, there's not so much distortion that the the technique and the subtleties of the, of the guitar playing are obscured. You can like feel the you can feel the way they're picking it, you can feel the bends. It's, uh, it's like so many great uh, guitar harmonies that aren't just there to be flashy, that actually are used tastefully. The drums are, I mean, they switch from just like full-on double kick, metal pedal, just like cool rhythms here. Killer organ, this is awesome. Oh. Some like really emotional changes. It actually tells a story. This is brilliant. One of the best I've ever heard in this genre. Not to mention that that pedaling guitar that opens the whole thing up. Rudy has chosen so people can be people. Composed by another Daisuke, 
Achiwa from Our No Surge, Ode to an Unborn Star. It does have that same sort of feel like you're in a, a market, a different place. Maybe it's the sort of Asian sounding strings and some of those like Indian sounding percussion. Like, boom, 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 that Moroccan style again. It's sort of like a lot of t- sort of familiar instruments, like something that could be a piano but is a little different. And then you got the synth stuff here with this great lyrical melody. So far we've had a ton of music that is a mix of sort of worldly traditional with very modern synth-driven stuff and then either funky or garagey, sort of like trip hop type drums. That's always my favorite part of when we listen to all the songs together and find out what's the surprise connection. Longbow has chosen from Binding of Isaac, Diptera Sonata, composed by, and probably performed by, Ridiculon.
about what a sonata is and uh, I really don't feel like I have any more of an understanding of it than I did before. Apparently it's some sort of way of classifying music in the way that a fugue was when they switched over from vocal music to classical music. I don't know. Maybe sonata is what they would call sort of like a main song back then. Who knows? Anyways, that's not the point. The point is that this creates an incredible dark atmosphere. These heavy halftime drums. Those like they sound like real drums with shitloads of compression, makes them really kind of dirty and grungy. A lot of reverb and delay. Gives it this underground, creepy feel. The single piano notes with lots and lots of reverb and delay on Almost like surf rock, but underground surf rock. Like if you just kind of inverted surf rock. And I haven't heard it repeated again, but there was this part way back in the beginning, three minutes ago, where they're doing this like chord changes and counterpoint of things. It's just this blowing me away with every single chord change. I, I need to hear it again. That's beautiful. Steve has brought us Food is a Part of Culture from Tales of Zillia 2, composed by a guy who is often on this show, Matoi Sakuraba. Beautiful theme. Sakuraba's work always, when you hear these really great composers and they are able to impart a lot of their of personality, maybe not their personality, but some kind of a personality, some kind of character into it. A lot of this sounds like typical JRPG town stuff, but with just enough variations and originality. And also, I think a lot of what makes this interesting is that really live drum the drum set that's being played and it's kind of like a shuffle of like but it's sort of half being played it's like there's not a lot of kick in it it's not in a hurry to really get anywhere it's maybe like a little steam engine that's just kind of putting around the same little town it's not going off on a grand adventure. And then you get this really sort of saloon-like piano. It really has that sort of cowboy feel to it. <laughs> and it's playing sort of bluesy licks. and It's just a total slow it down. You're in a small town now. I know you've been out on the world map fighting giant dragons and shit. But uh, here, food's a part of the culture. That's all we really do. We get up, we eat a few times a day, and we... Everybody does their choice to make sure there'll be food for tomorrow and years to come. Okay, really fun. The last track composed by Motoi Sakuraba. This next one also by Motoi Sakuraba. This time it's from Tales of Hearts R. It is Glitter Like a Star. This one was chosen by Zenness. <laughs>
Not the smoothest transition for the loop. But uh, there it is. This is boss theme number six. Pretty amazing that uh, Sakuraba, I composed that sleepy little swing theme. And then something like this is just balls to the wall. Of course it is. It's going to be, it's not only a battle theme for the JRPG, but it is a boss theme. So you need to really amp things up because you've already been amping things up when you take people from town themes to regular battle, maybe normal battles. Boss theme number six. Pull out all the stops. Organ. Not a lot of guitar, a lot more synth, and a lot of flashy drums, just like really persistent drums, a lot of tension, a lot of dread. Great boss theme. I did not pick great background music to listen to boss music. <laughs> this is part one of the playthrough. My bad. Well, let's finish off round two of these selections with a pick from Chris. This is from Titanfall, When Two Sides Go to War, composed by Stephen Barton. Still got half a track to go. nice mix of well like Rudy had said a very weird choice of instruments for a futuristic mech game but what I think this track wants to illustrate is in the first half way more organic instruments real real sounding drums acoustic guitar and then you bring in this really uh, futuristically kind of bop, 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 that sort of futuristic army Metal Gear Solid type um, that it's like a delayed percussive really hard synth drum and I think that that's showing that Titanfall is a game made up of uh, you know little peons little six foot people and then big giant titans and then combining and them coming together that's the way I see it anyway but it's a very epic Hans Zimmer inspired just endlessly rising up to the next challenge and there's like a there's a hope and there's a reverence and there's a respect and there's a lot of drama Really nice. 
And so that ends round two of our selections. Notable admissions from 2014's video game music. Nothing from Dark Souls 2 on the list. Nothing from Bravely Default. Banner Saga. Nothing from South Park, The Stick of Truth, like the background. And of course, there's nothing from Yoshi's New Island, like this track here, Yoshi's Clan. Our final round of picks. First up, chosen by Claudio from Shantae and the Pirate Curse. Shantae shows up a lot in our top 20 lists. This is Arctic Justice, Frostbite Island, composed by Jake Kaufman, who also composed for Shovel Knight. <laughs> music and then i realize it's a platformer i think god I should give this game a try and then i look at that really ugly font but who knows it does have beautiful art so i just don't know who chose that font it's like it's designed to be looked at on a crappy mobile phone how about that baseline not here there's a part where it starts to the turnover so bloody good and this music reminds me a lot of um mega man in the way it's got that kind of galloping rock style, a lot of different uh, pieces to the song, really propulsive and energetic, using that Dorian scale for that sort of heroic sound. But it's really that bass line in which section? Hasn't come up again. There's a lot to this track, a lot of different layers, tons of different instruments. Goes to lots of different places. This would not get boring to listen to. Oof. This is a hell of a track. Rudy's final pick from Velocity 2X, Gin Tinder Lab, composed by Joris Deman and James Marsden.
this takes everything that is good from EDM instead of like house music with um, the really ethereal those kind of pad sounds the uh, the hard drum beat I really like how it's not just it's got a bit of a jump to it not a like really hard symbol like but just it's a little more dancey it's a little more agile it kind of reminds me of what we're seeing this character do flying around oh my god and then that key change out of nowhere and these big arpeggios it's a beautiful track so much movement so much beauty i think it fits gameplay perfectly which is a hard thing to do if somebody says you know just make it really strong and really beautiful and emotional Oh dear God, Steve's last pick for this week is from Sonic and All-Stars Racing, Transformed. This is Adder's Lair, originally from Golden Axe, I guess, composed by Richard Jacques. I'm not really familiar with the uh, Golden Axe music, so, and I wouldn't have thought that they'd be like, we got to bring back Golden Axe music in a Sonic All-Stars racing game. I guess they went back in the roster of what's an All-Star in Sega, and the Golden Axe people are now racing carts. That'd be funny to see. It's an interesting track. It's, it's a really kitchen sink track. It has everything in it. The, everything, the rhythm is really busy. There's a uh, lot, many layers of melodies, and uh, it's just a really full, full on track. But I guess you can hear that more simpler medley of. Bum, 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 bum. Must be what's from Golden Axe. If you put a gun to my head or an axe. Zenmus' last pick is from Danganronpa 2 Goodbye Despair. Iko Roshia, composed by Masafumi Takata. <laughs> Thank you. 
Man, that trumpet is such a nice surprise, and they really give it a lot of room, and they let the trumpet feel like it's played by a person, and they are playing a solo, where there's there's nothing else trying to like fill in the gaps, and they're really just letting the trumpet... Jesus Christ. Uh, they let the trumpet breathe. <laughs> Pun not intended. Let it, let it do some really like personality-filled kind of quirks, and... Just all like those little flourishes that a human would add. And it just gives it a lot of personality and gives it kind of like a mischievous, quirky feel, which I think is, uh, Danganronpa has a lot of mischievous in it. As we see this murder that looks like a nice painting. All right, final picks coming up. Chris's last pick from Divinity Original Sin 1. This is Forest of Fairy Tales, composed by Kirill Pokrovsky. funny, as that main part continues on, it starts sounding like it's getting a bit out of time with itself, but it's because the flute, I think, is playing with delay. And the delay is spaced out enough that it's playing along with its own delay, and then that's playing along with its own delay, and along with its own delay. So it's sort of like something the edge would do from U2. It's just a fun little trick. like a, It's a fun little gimmick just to set this track apart. And it sounds like they did it live as opposed to just, you know, doing everything digitally in, in the studio like you can. You have so much control, but I like that there's that little bit of a off-timeness. It just sounds like you came across a busker who's using a delay audio spell in the world uh, just to add a bit of fun. And the thing with Divinity Original Sin is it's, it's a CRPG that is probably the most lighthearted and... It's de it definitely does not take itself very seriously. We have a video on this channel where I talk with Ink of the Dragon and he ranks his top five CRPGs because he went through a huge phase where he played all of them. And uh, he put Div Sin 2 pretty highly on the list and a lot of people are complaining because they say they just... they don't like that everything in in the world has to be a joke. And it's, it's true. It's a... They're almost always really funny. There are some really serious parts though. Like, I, I wouldn't say that everything is a joke. It's just... They just never shy away from trying to make a joke. I just love the battle system in Original Sin 2. 
I didn't play much of one. One is really badly paced where there's this murder mystery they make you do in the beginning. So you do a few battles, you see how fun the battle system is, and then you don't get to battle for hours as you're solving a murder mystery, which is a really fun thing to do, but really they should have done that and maybe uh, after like three or four hours of story and uh, teaching you the battle system and, and then slow down and solve a murder mystery. But it was, you know, it was their first shot at it. Although these are all like developers from old, well-loved CRPGs, I believe. Yeah, you know what? It could have the pacing could have been more of a problem because Chris is saying it introduces introduces you to the world. I played it with ink, and uh, so you're like a little. I find I'm a little less patient when I'm playing with somebody, and just because I like the combat so much, I'm like, oh, let's get into battles. I really want to learn and dive into this combat system. And there's a lot to remember in these games too, for like who has what skill and you know what spells can you use. But they're incredible games. They're they're like Breath of the Wild where I can hop into original sin 2 i've never beaten it but every time i hop into it there's always something interesting around the corner that you'll you'll come to find and and an epic battle that is gonna be a hell of a challenge and i love like so many of the battles in this game feel like you're not going to be able to win and then if you come at it from a different angle all of a sudden what seemed impossible is very possible penultimate track chosen by longbow from child of light I think that was a PS Plus game. Dark Creatures. This is composed by Cure de Pirate. <laughs> It's a really nice uh, track. It starts off with a really unique uh, piano riff to it, and then you've got a lot of strings and a lot of weight and cymbal washes, but it does definitely avoid becoming too overloaded with all the different instruments and layers, and uh, I think it retains a lot of magic to it. Oh, it's just like some those nice movements with those uh, with the lower notes. Kind of reminds me of something Yoko Taro would do. No, not Yoko Taro. Yoko Shimomura. It's got a, you know, for for such the heavy weight of all of these different orchestral instruments, it has a lot of agility to it. Sounds like a little character kind of skipping, you know, from one part to the other. 
It's like those high flutes are trying to avoid being dragged down by the weight of all the low register instruments in the orchestra. Our last track of the day, chosen by El Azul. This is from Professor Layton and Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney. Pursuit, Spellbreaker, Casting Magic, and El Azul. He doesn't care about composers, so we don't know. That's a big heavy theme. I really had to go find a cutscene. We couldn't just be watching two people talk to each other doing this whole thing. Big, dramatic, epic, dark, swirling. This is how I like my ice cream. And the song's pretty good too. If you're watching the YouTube version, it's over. If you'd like to participate, join our Discord. If you don't see a Discord join link, give us a comment and one will be hand delivered to you in a comment reply. That's right, no extra charge. <laughs> 